Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I am Jennifer Kamano. I am a certified fundraising executive, and I have the great pleasure of working for the Friends of Pima Animal Care Center. A lot of people know PAC. We're in Tucson, Arizona, and we cover 9,000 square miles. Um, the Friends Group is the official nonprofit partner to our municipal shelter. So I am so excited to talk to you today about key ingredients for campaign success, prepping the secret sauce. And this is, of course, all the stuff you have to do before you actually start a campaign. I know, you think that you can just dive right in, but get, and I'm a dive right in kind of person, but this is so not that. This is definitely planning for a marathon. And in order to be successful, you gotta, you gotta prepare. So let's, let's dive right in. So context is everything. Who are you and who are the stakeholders? Friends of PAC is an official nonprofit partner to the municipal shelter, but I know some of you listening are actually the municipal shelter, or perhaps you are a 501c3 that partners and has the contract for the municipal shelter. Um, you could be a rescue group. You could be somewhere rural, serving very few. Uh, you could be in the middle of an urban jungle like Dallas where there's multiple rescues and multiple shelters. So you could be brand new, like the Friends of PAC were brand new, or you could be established. I understand that context is everything. So please understand when you're listening to this webinar that you might have to tweak it here and there to make more sense for your audience. So who are we? Pima Animal Care Center and the Friends of PAC. I wanna provide a little bit of context to who we are. In late 2014, the voters of Pima County passed a $22 million bond, Prop 415, to build a new animal shelter. This community decided that their pets were worth it and they wanted to see us doing better by animals in our community. We leveraged that because that was such an important piece to have that kind of community support and that broad publicity. And so at the same time, the Friends of PAC began with the Community Foundation. And we can talk a little bit about that later. It, they, it's, it's really fabulous to work with the Community Foundation because they lend credibility and they also provide some oversight. So you're making sure you're doing the right things in terms of writing bylaws, articles of incorporation, um, putting a board together, and thinking about the appropriate things you need to either get your 501c3 going which is what we did, and in 2016, we had that, and we broke away from the Community Foundation. In early 2017, we began to raise money for Your Love Saves Lives, investing in PAC programs for today and tomorrow. We were in a silent phase to try to raise big dollars first, and we can talk a little bit more about that later. And it was maybe four months later when I was hired as the executive director for the Friends of PAC. Part of this is that the community um, wasn't super keen on raising money for a government shelter. So this is one of the reasons this 501c3 was started. There's a real separation between what the county offers with your taxpayer dollars and what a private or a nonprofit organization can provide that extra layer of love for the municipal shelter. So there's a real clear separation between who's doing what. And that was very important to the donors here in Pima County. And I say donors a lot, and I meant voters, but hopefully all the voters are donors. <laughs> That's some positive thinking from yours truly. Um, so we didn't actually go into a community gift phase until mid-2018. And we were quite a ways to our goal already. And that is another important piece that I will bring up later. And by December of 2018, we actually hit our goal. We needed all of December to raise those dollars, but we hit our goal, and it was absolutely fantastic. So here's a picture of our brand new facility, the Pima Animal Care Center in Pima County, and it's gorgeous. It's 65,000 square feet of light, breezy, um, somewhat quiet, uh, you know, separate ventilation systems things that are all state of the art, our clinic is gorgeous, and the taxpayers built this. So we really leveraged this piece in the campaign to talk about programs because we raised money for programs. 
building the foundation for campaign success, really, really the most important thing is your leadership. Who is leading this crusade? And what does it take to get the right people involved? And what does it take to keep them involved? That cannot be understated. This is really one of the most important things. Of course, it includes vision and planning, and it, you have to have your tools in place. In our case, we had written agreements with partners, which is critical, and we look at them every year. And I also put self-care in here because this is a long uh, campaign. It's a long haul. you got to be in good shape. you got to drink a lot of water and rest. And I think that that is a key piece. To going the distance in a campaign. And this is Wendigo. And Wendigo was just ferocious when she first arrived. But you can see the serenity in her eyes after some loving care from us. So let's talk about leadership. Who are the right people for your campaign? Who are the right people to get this thing going and to get more of the right people? For us, it was county leadership. We had the county administrator, the assistant county administrator, the deputy county administrator. All of these people helped us pave the way so we could use their printing. We have office space with them. Uh, we have an agreement that says, yes, we can, Friends of PAC, even though we're not a specific county entity, we can utilize the services of the county. This was a huge, huge, it still is a huge, huge deal for us. So having staff on board, because county staff includes our Pima Animal Care Center staff. So our director of the animal services, Kristen Hassan Auerbach, is also part of the leadership committee, of course. We, in our case, hired a campaign consultant. So do you or don't you? A lot of you may wonder that. I would say that if you've never done this before, go ahead and hire a campaign consultant. It is hard to juggle these things. Uh, it's extra work on top of everything you're supposed to be doing already. And having someone keep you on track and having someone who knows the community and leaders in the community and can help them understand what the vision is for your plan and get them on this committee, whether it's a fundraising committee or a prospect task force, and we'll talk about the different kinds of committees later, but getting them interested and for all the right reasons. You also need a nonprofit board, staff and volunteers, uh, or in our case, we did. We were the nonprofit board, I'm the staff, and you know the other board members were volunteers. But you may have an existing friends group in your shelter already. What do you have that are already inside your shelter fundraising? What are the programs that you're raising money for? Who is leading the charge in that respect? These are important things to know and leverage for your success. Please don't reinvent the wheel. A lot of this stuff has been done. There are people who are already so passionate and know those with deeper pockets. This is a wonderful place to start and they should be on your campaign committee. And of course, the last part I have are the different kinds of committees, which we will go into later, but you need leadership to not just mm, provide oversight, but you need workers, you need implementers and people who are going to come they're going to show up, they're going to come with ideas, and they're going to help open doors for you. So what is the vision? What is the plan? What is the inspiration? This is so important. You obviously have some kind of idea. Okay, we need to raise money. Well, what for? Is it bricks and mortar? And again, we'll get there later. But this piece, your case for support, it answers the questions of the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Just the facts. You want it to be maybe a page or two, have a couple pictures. This is your critical piece of your case for support. Why should anyone care about raising money for your animal shelters programs or bricks and mortar or endowments? Why should they care? Let out all the stops, get some professional writers, tug at the heartstrings. This is truly where having you know the, the animals as your cause can help you in development. Nothing really pulls at the heartstrings much more than, look at that little guy with his hard hat on. He helps construct our new facility, isn't he cute? And that's our chief vet, Dr. Jennifer Wilcox. She was a critical piece, actually. I, I, I said staff, but I kind of glossed over Dr. Wilcox. A lot of people want to give to medical. Um, that is a real heart tugger. 
So Dr. Wilcox is extremely passionate and highly intelligent and great fun to have at a party. So we would invite her and she would speak very eloquently about all the lives she saved and all the wonderful stories from down in the trenches. People love that stuff. As long as it's not too gory and stays inspirational. That's another piece we'll talk about language. So you need to have a general plan of what you want to do and not just the case for support, but how are you going to roll it out? You know, the first part of it's going to maybe take you three months. I don't know, maybe six months if you're brand new to start formulating the committees you need. Um, then what's phase two? Is phase two building out all of the, um, all of the um, collateral materials and your messaging um, and then you have a phase where you're in the silent phase. So, so having kind of a general plan, like how are we going to do this? What do we think? It's, you know, how long is it going to take? And, and also a period where you're testing your messages. This is another piece that before you go out into the public too much, you're looking at your lead donors and saying, hey, how does this resonate for you? Does this sound like something you would give to? Can you make suggestions? Um, these are also wonderful ways, of course, for garnering support from those folks. Um, you also need to have some really compelling and professionally shot videos. So I tried to intersperse them throughout my PowerPoint here, but like this is a great photo of Dr. Wilcox. So we did talk a little bit about what kind of campaign are you running. There are different kinds. Um, typically, capital campaigns are bricks and mortar. You're, you're building a new facility. Well, our bricks and mortar campaign was taken care of by the voters of Pima County at $22 million. So we had to be very careful with our messaging around comprehensive campaigns. So you will see in this slide that Your Love Saves Lives comprehensive campaign program costs. This is what we were raising money for. And this is just a, a slight overview. You could definitely look at our website. Um, we have infographics there to kind of drill down on what animal care excellence is and what community engagement looks like. Um, so part of life-saving programs uh, was foster programming. We have four foster care coordinators and three years of programming for that, just for example. But if you look on the right side, you can see we, we pick up staffing, supplies, services, contracted medical services for pets um, easily is over $100,000 a year for the Friends of PAC. So that's a huge, and that's what vote, uh, donors would, would like to spend their money on a lot of the time. We get a lot of donations for medical. So that was a big part of our campaign. We also built in uh, volunteer recognition. You know, I, I'm a firm believer in recognizing your staff and your volunteers. It helps with retention, and it just really, in the grand scheme of things, does not cost that much to say thank you. You can also raise money for endowments. So this is um, what I would like to do next. <laughs> um, so you can have endowments that are about operations. You can have them for maintenance and repair on a building. Uh, you can offer scholarships. There's endowments can be um, unrestricted, uh, but they, they usually have some kind of a um, sort of focus that they're, they're raising money for. So that's our, our next uh, project here at the Friends of PAC. Um, what other tools do you need to work uh, work a really strong campaign? I there it is again. ID and endless campaign volunteers. These are your leaders. Um, but what other tools will advance your case? You may or may not have an existing donor base. When I started, we had 1,600 people in our donor base. Some of them were donors. Most of them were donors. But that's not very many to build a five million dollar campaign. So part of our master cooperative agreement with the county, which I will go over shortly, has um, a sharing of data. So we were allowed to use donors to, who made donations directly to PAC. Do you have a CRM software? Do you have a customer relation management software? We use an online one called DonorSnap. There's tons of them. There's Boomerang. There's Salesforce. There's Blackboard. Blackboard has a ton of them. Um, so you need to have this. If you don't have this, you absolutely need to figure out a donor database. Where are you going to keep the information? And as much information as you can put in there, 
the better. So say you win the lottery and you're you're out of your job, you know, someone's going to take over. What are you leaving in place for the success of your organization? This is all really weedy, detailed stuff, but it's so critical to the future success of your organization to put those notes in there. Oh, I talked to Betty Sue and um, she just lost her dog or she's got us in her will. Maybe we've never seen any paperwork, but putting a note in the database for someone else in the future. Can't, um, I can't emphasize that enough. There's also wealth screening softwares and there's a ton of those out there. Um, and we used one called Donor Search and you basically can find out who your existing donors are and what their capacity is. You, there's, there's infinite sorts of things you can do with wealth screening and it really depends on the context of your organization. So um, we'll get into that in just a little bit. Uh, and then there's email marketing software. We use Constant Contact. Maybe you have MailChimp. I'm, I'm not endorsing any of these. I don't really know. I just know there's a lot of them and that you need to do some research on which one is the best one for you. All right, written agreements. Now, not all of these will apply to you, but they certainly did to, to the Friends of PAC and Pima Animal Care Center. One of the things that the county wanted to do was establish a format that they could maybe use for other organizations like the Friends of the Library, uh, like a memorial foundation that's being put up within the city limits. So we created a master cooperative agreement. It's definitely filled with legalese. It essentially says that the Friends, of, that the Pima Animal Care Center is going to um, sign this agreement with the Friends of PAC. This is what the Friends of PAC are gonna do. This is what the county's going to do. We're going to look at it every year. And it says things like um, the county is going to give us three office spaces, three desk spaces, workstations. Uh, they're gonna cover our IT and our printing. It lays out things like that. And in return, we're going to raise the money. So this had quite a few parties sign off on it. And then we look at it every year and amend language. One of the things we amended was an additional workspace. Another thing we amended was the time it took to get uh, the audit back to the county to show them. So they initially asked for 90 days. Um, anybody in the financial world knows that's a really hard thing to do right after your fiscal year ends. So now we have 120 days. So little things like that, it allowed for tweaking of our agreement on an annual basis. And then we have a joint work plan. And that certainly has changed over the years once we completed the campaign. But during the campaign, the joint work plan was extremely detailed. And it had the county carrying a lot of the weight in the beginning as the Friends of PAC got up and running. So even if it's donor acknowledgement for gifts, and we pooled gifts for this because we, we raised money with PAC. It was Friends of PAC and PAC raising $5 million. And so gifts that came to PAC counted. Um, and so, we had to um, figure out how to track all of that, which was, whew, I could do a, a webinar just on tracking gifts. Um, but we had to work out who was doing what and when. So once it got to the community gifts phase of our campaign, uh, Friends of PAC was really uh, carrying most of the work, if that makes sense. And today our joint work plan is much smaller um, because we're not in a campaign right now. The other thing that the county did in conjunction with us is we worked out naming opportunities and the levels at which people could name things. So for $5,000, they could put their name on a kennel. Um, they could name a small medical play yard. Um, for $2 million, they could name our whole campus. Uh, just so you know, we didn't get that gift, but we did get a couple at uh, a million and close to it. Um, you have to come up with donor intent forms and donor pledge forms. So these are different. They're very, they're slightly different. The pledge form is really kind of lays out when they're going to make a gift and how much that gift is going to be. Whereas the donor intent form is a little bit broader. Uh, we had one donor sign it and say, yep, I'm going to give you a million dollars. I'm going to give it over the next three years. And that was kind of it. And later we went back and got a pledge form where they really kind of laid out when they were going to make which gifts. 
And lastly, we had naming agreements because this is a county facility and also because they saw the county officials saw this as an opportunity to um, be able to get be able to run a campaign like this in similar organizations, like I said, could be the Friends of the Library or other such groups that support county facilities. So we have a naming agreement um, and and this is pretty detailed. I don't want to get too far into it, but it's a contract essentially that says, um, you know, your sign will be up for this long if you make this gift on this date and, you know, we reserve the right to take it down if, you know, for whatever reason or, you know, if the if the facility um, uh, is bought by somebody else. So there, there's all sorts of legalese kinds of agreements and and we as the Friends of PAC reached out and had some legal fees with this, but by and large, we used the Pima County Attorney's Office to draft a lot of these. Well, kids, I know I've talked about a lot and I talked about it pretty quickly, but here's a very important graphic. It's a little fuzzy, those are not your eyes, but um, it's so important. This is a marathon, this takes a long time and you might have days where you're feeling a little down about it, but don't worry, that'll pass. So definitely go do your stamp collecting, go to yoga, go to Pilates and boxing, tell yourself that you're good enough and you're strong enough, hang out with your friends and family, and definitely stay hydrated. We're here in the desert. You, you have to carry water bottle with you everywhere. And I know this sounds kind of funny, but I'm not kidding because it's a long haul and you know, you'll get there. You will. So it's a marathon and do not forget to take care of yourself. All right. So I'm not gonna talk, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about getting to work. It's really hard not to. I'm kind of like chomping at the bit to tell you all the things you have to do, but I don't want to shortchange that prep stage. And some of this getting to work, this is part of the prep stage too. At least not the whole public is gonna know about this stuff. So getting to work, I have, uh, Broken down a bit to professional support, wealth screening, the different campaign committees, the different campaign phases, gift cracking and donor recognition, just a little, and then going public. So all of this stuff is before you even tell the world what you're doing. This is Figo. He came to us um, and needed a lot of work, but got adopted successfully. He's so cute. I love this guy. So let's talk about the different kinds of professional support you need. There's in-kind support. Don't forget the in-kind support. So important. And then there's contracted support. So we did. We hired a campaign consultant, and she helped us so very much, especially in the early stages. Once we got to the community gift phase, I think we were we were flowing a little bit more on our own. But the campaign consultants can help you um, vet certain leaders in the community. Um, they can help you write this case for support. They can help you build the communication tools that you will need to use with your campaign committees because they're full-time people doing other things. We have one running a hospital. So how am I gonna get their attention? when I need it. You have to have communication tools built in. Um, and that includes texting sometimes because you have to find out what's the best way that they communicate. And I found out that the head of the hospital, she's, she's right on it with text. So that's how we communicated a lot of the time. Anyway, the campaign consultant is pretty critical. Uh, typically, they uh, take, there's sort of a formula where they, have a, they take a percentage of the campaign and you pay them um, kind of a little bit in the beginning, a lot in the middle, and then again, it tapers off at the end. And all of that is dependent upon how much money you're raising, and again, where you are, what's your budget, all sorts of factors like that. That could be a whole webinar, really. Should you hire one, and what do you need to know? We also needed a lot of help with technology. I migrated 25,000 donor records from PAC into my donor snap for Friends of PAC. That was no easy feat, and there was duplication, and I needed both donor snap help people to help me, and I was so grateful for our IT guy at PAC. Um, so county employee helped us just an absolute ton. 
and making friends, thanking them. Don't forget to thank these people that really <clears throat> aren't maybe part of your committee, but are critical to your success. Um, we needed help with graphics. Uh, it was about seven months into the campaign and into my tenure before I was able to hire a development and marketing specialist. So I started in September of 2017 and ran solo until about February of 2018. And um, you, you need help. You need help building the graphic look for your um, campaign because it's got to look fun, right? It's got to look um, inspirational. Um, and and so I'm getting ahead of myself, but you're going to need um, printers, a mail house, help people to help you with marketing um, and events and how you're going to market those events. So all of these are, are critical and you're going to need to build them. And and the, and the good news is they're they're probably already you know, they bubbled up to the top, hopefully, in your organization, um, even if you're new. There's obviously, hopefully, hopefully, there's a group of like-minded people who are like, hey, I know how to do that. And and this isn't rocket science. You know, there's some basics that you need to know about marketing and graphics. And I, I, I have an opinion, even though I, I can't necessarily design it myself. So, all right, let's talk about wealth screenings. Just an itty-bitty bit. So there are a lot of different softwares and you can look those up. One of the things I'm so crazy excited about is that now the, the wealth screening we have is fully integrated with our CRM. So I can look up people who have made maybe a $50 gift, a $100 gift, or for our organization, typically it's 500 to 1,000. It's a leadership gift. It's Someone who might be able to give more, it's a good indicator that, you know, make a call, invite them to something. They might have more there. But with an integrated wealth screening software component, you can actually look to see if they have capacity and inclination to give to your organization in a, in a large way. So what do we do with this? I think this part's really interesting. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we worked our campaign. So we pulled all the data from Kima Animal Care Center of those who had made a donation when they bought your license. So they can do a licensing fee online. They can also mail it in. And we had anyone who gave $50 or more throughout Pima County, we pulled and we sent it to be screened for um, wealth indicators, of course. We had about 6,600 names that we did that with. So we segmented by the $50 and up, and then we segmented by certain zip codes that we know in this community tend to have more affluent demographics. We came up with 1,700 names, and then we put all those 1,700 names in a spreadsheet with various columns, and we got together about 20 people in our community and we they were our prospect review task force and each meeting we had three meetings in the very beginning and at each meeting we went through about 600 names with this group and you're looking for things like do they give well obviously we know they give right because they're already in our database do they have a dog do they have a cat do they live here part-time we have a lot of snowbirds where i live so they come and they they're here part of the time um, so we segmented them. We went through wealth screenings, the 1,700 that bubbled up to the top. We sat down with a group of people, and we looked at ability, affinity, association, who knows them, who can make a warm introduction. Those were critical notes, critical, and you have to follow up on them because people will forget. They'll walk away from that meeting, and they'll have the best of intentions, but they'll forget. Oh, my gosh, I was supposed to introduce Jennifer to Peggy over at the Million Bucks Foundation. So, of course, a million bucks is nothing these days, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so what you're going for always in development, and especially with major gifts, is who is the right person? What is the right ask? When's the right time? And who are we asking and for what reason? So lucky for us, people like to give to pets. So hopefully there's more than one or two of those folks. So campaign phases and champions. 
this, I wanted to show you, this is the graphic we use for our campaign, Your Love Saves Lives, Investing in PAC Programs for Today and Tomorrow. That's Fred and Winona. Winona's the dog. Fred's the cat, of course. And these are our little spokespersons for, spokespersons, spokes pets for the campaign. So it's fun. It's uplifting. Um, it, it tugs at the heartstring with love and saving lives. And it also very clearly describes what the campaign is. We're investing in the programs for today and tomorrow. We're going to spend this money right away, uh, which, which comes up for us when we talk about messaging uh, the campaign later. A lot of people thought, well, oh, you, you were successful and you have all this money now. But we had to keep telling them we, we've been spending this money, right, it's for today. It's campaign programs for today and tomorrow. So one thing I, I forgot to mention on, on one of the previous slides, is when you start a large campaign, we have, uh, there are gift charts, which sort of let you know how many gifts do you need to raise that are gigantic and how many do you need to raise that are really little. It helps you kind of set parameters around how many people you need to go talk to um, how, and how many gifts and what the goals are for that level, uh, for, for those levels of gifts, whether they're below $100 or above a million dollars. So this is a pretty key uh, part of the campaign and something that a campaign consultant can help you with. And I do have a website listed for one of many gift chart calculators. And you'll see what I mean. So the committee and leadership support is so critical. We had an overall campaign council. We also had people who sat just on the leadership gift committee. And these were, we were trying to, um, to raise money at the $500,000 and up level. So this was a really important uh, council or committee of people that could help us open those doors. That was pretty much their, their role. Um, we had a different, completely different uh, group of people who were our prospect review committee. And again, that was like 20 people that would be willing to make an, um, warm introductions for us. Uh, and they were people that worked at the community foundation, other successful nonprofits that weren't um, animal welfare agencies. So we have the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum here. Um, we had a woman from there help us. So she's also familiar, they're, they're highly successful fundraisers. They know a lot of out of town people. Um, so having a real diversification on this prospect review uh, committee is important. For the other gift levels, you might have committees. We had a benefactor committee, pace setter committee. We had a community gift committee. And these are people who are willing to put out, um, again, um, put things up on their Facebook pages, make warm introductions, share stories. We even had a planned giving committee. So these are the kinds of committees you can have. Um, not all of these were as robust as, as some of the others. So I will say that. They don't have to be perfectly um, populated with, you know, exactly eight people per committee. On some of them, we had three people. Uh, so, so there's a little, little uh, leeway, I think, in there. Another thing that I want to say is you really, in campaigns, for our organization, in our community, um, there's, I don't want to say it's a short attention span, but if you're in a large committee, uh, sorry, a large campaign um, for a long period of time, people get tired of hearing about your story. So <laughs> even in the case of our wonderful story, and we really have a wonderful story to share. So you want to, we were in the silent phase until we got 75% to goal. So when we were about $4 million to our $5 million goal, that's when we announced it. And again, you're making warm introductions, you're having house parties, you're doing all those naming opportunities and letting people know. We have this stuff done um, professionally. So the campaign collateral for naming opportunities, we had a map of the building, we had a beautiful four page brochure. Um, and again, that came from in-kind design support and the printing at the county. So it actually didn't cost us anything. And then, of course, the public phase is a total marketing extravaganza. I had so much fun. We put that cute little sign right there up on billboards and bus signs and uh, bus shelters. We have these little bus shelters here that uh, have, I don't they're highly effective uh, banner ads that hang on those shelters. We did that. We went on um, multiple radio stations, on television. We did PSAs, but we had a budget. We also bought things. 
um, we felt that this was uh, just incredibly important that we had control over who the audience was. Um, we went to public radio. Uh, we have a community radio station and then we have our NPR affiliate. Uh, they run on air campaigns here, both of them. So the folks that listen tend to be um, active donors. We reached out to AM radio and we did a couple of talk shows there. Um, and we were all over social media. This stuff is animal welfare is just born for social media um, campaigns. People get actively involved. They share stories. They give. Now you can give on Facebook. It's so it's it's really great. Um, we started an El Tour de Tucson. It's, it's a huge bike race here, um, and people come from all over the world to participate. We got our own team going just because volunteers wanted to. And you know we had to have it be primarily volunteer run, but we raised uh, $15,000 in our first year in the El Tour de Tucson. And so far, it's in November. So far this year, we have uh, almost 40 riders. So we're so excited. So this is just a tiny little drop in an otherwise gigantic sea of tracking and acknowledgement. Um, but it shows you, this is our actual campaign progress report as of the end of the campaign. So you'll see that we had, um, and our various committees are listed listed at the bottom on the, on the left, the benefactors, the pace setters, and the community gifts. And it kind of um, shows you also what size gifts those are and kind of where we landed. So we had our goals and where we got to goal. And I'm most impressed by the community goal. Look at that. We wanted to raise 900,000 at the very end of our campaign. And I mean, we almost doubled that. I, that's just a testament to how we're making such huge changes at PAC and the community knows about it and they approve. That's how I look at this. So there's our, um, you might have questions around this. For example, up at the top where you see under campaign goals, pledge to date, uh, there were a couple gifts that didn't actually come in there. And then under anticipated, why, why is that anticipated? There's no written agreement. So these are gifts that, oh, yes, I'm going to give you that. They were from an excellent source, but we didn't have anything in writing around it. So this was a spreadsheet, and along the bottom were about 13 different tabs that just tracked all gifts to PAC, just tracked all gifts to friends of PAC, just tracked, you know, um, the individual tabs might just be the benefactor gifts. And they had things like, you know, when the gifts came in, how much of the gifts came in, um, how much is being pledged? Did they get their gift acknowledgement? Are they picking a naming opportunity? So, so this is just a tiny bit of an otherwise really large spreadsheet. So here are some of our ads. Aren't they cute? These are shelter pets. These are our shelter pets, except for the one on the left with the paws. That was stock footage. But, you know, it was really important for me to make sure that we were using animals that look like animals we serve in our shelter. Um, they're not all purebreds. Some of them, um, the purebreds are, are picked over by rescues and that's okay, we want that. We wanna get them out of there. You know, Pima Animal Care sees 17,000 pets a year. In the summer, there was one day over the summer, we had 160 pets come in in one day. You can guess that a lot of those were tiny baby kittens and you'd be right, but you know, that's a lot. It's a lot of animals. So I wanted, I wanted the dogs and cats that we used on our materials to look like dogs and cats from our shelter. And you'll see again, I listed online, we did Google ads. We are, we are on Twitter, we are on Instagram, we are on Facebook. Um, so not just the one platform, all of them. Um, I don't know how to get on Snapchat, but my teenage daughter doesn't even use any of the other ones anymore. So, you know, you gotta stay in the know because pretty soon there's gonna be a new app that you'll be expected to use. And, and it's a diversification. So yes, we wanna to get to the people that have the money, but you don't always know, like, and you know, you can have a grandma who's working on, who's on Instagram all over the place. I know tons of people who do that. So you wanna be in all of those mediums. And, and I don't know how to use all of them, but I have a wonderful development and marketing specialist who does. Thank goodness for her. We also went into print. Uh, we, we, because we're a new organization, we want people to know who we are. That's a 
huge part for us. So you might be an organization where people already know who you are, but they don't for us. So we were in print, we're on radio, we're on cable and TV, we're on um, banner, digital banner ads. Um, and you want to, I don't want to, as much as you're um, throwing all of this out there to the public, remember that behind it is a story. Don't forget your story. Don't forget that your story is about an individual pet, that that moves people more than anything else. So we put things up like that all the time. You have to message things. What is your language? It's, it, you want it to be inspirational, right? You want people to feel that they can make an impact, that they can really help you uh, and help this pet, you know, help your organization deliver the services to this particular pet. So it's, it's motivating and it's impactful. And it tells them what to do. And it doesn't have to be overwhelming with details. So look at that. It's our it's our logo. Your love saves lives. Donate today. And some of these, um, if they were bus signs, may have had donate today and also our website. So that's minimal. So what are some key takeaways? I, I know I've covered a lot and, and it's my first time ever doing this. So I'm sure that uh, I've forgotten some things. Um, and I'm happy to talk more, um, but let's talk about some key takeaways. Your pre-work is intensive and critical. You, you cannot not do this stuff. And so you don't have to, um, maybe you're doing a $500,000 campaign and you've got a lot of support out there already. So you take bits and pieces of this, but do not forget to pick the right leaders and to communicate with them often to check in with them about how they're feeling. So you may be communicating with them and think you're doing an excellent job, but maybe they want you to be answering a question that you're not answering. Pick up the phone. Don't just send an email. Maybe you're texting, but pick up the phone and try to talk to people. And, and, and breathe a lot because it's overwhelming. Some of this stuff comes at you so fast. And remember I said that leadership before all else, you, you gotta have someone driving the boat or the bus or the train or whatever you're driving, you know, a hovercraft. Um, ongoing communication, critical, below, above, to the side, like, and, and, and change it. And you can tell people that, look, I know I told you something last week. I'm so sorry. We're changing it again. Um, be human. Be, be transparent. One of the things that I've learned more recently in the nonprofit world are um, traits of lean startups. And so people coming from the business sector understand this. But it's also, it's a lot about testing your messages and your stories and modifying, changing. Oh, that didn't work very well. Let's try something else. Or pivoting. Uh, sometimes something happens. Um, you see this a lot even right now with Best Friends after uh, Hurricane Dorian, how they pivot to help, you know, like, okay, we were, we're doing all this other stuff, but right now we're going to take a hard right and we're going to really help this, uh, this, this uh, community that has suffered you know, a horrible disaster. I, I used to work for the Red Cross, so we did this a lot. We even planned for it, right? Because we knew we were going to have tornadoes and hurricanes. Anyway, being able to pivot and change your message is okay. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about after campaign expectations. This really surprised me. I had been, I, I've been in development a long time. And you're always supposed to say thank you and we made it to our goal. But sometimes what has happened in our campaign is people think that we have no more need. There's no more need. You raised $5 million. You did a great job. You did it really quickly. We helped you. So why aren't you spending, why are you asking for more money? So the only thing I can say about this is I still think it's important to thank your donors for helping you get to goal. I think it's important to put infographics on your website and all, on your online platforms and message out, yes, thank you. But this is an ongoing need. You know, for example, our intake is up this year. Halfway through the year, our intake is up 1,000 over where it was at this time last year. So I think that's a trend we're, we're seeing across the nation, but it's worrisome to us. Of course, B, I'm thinking, oh, good, that's a good message I can push out to people because it doesn't end. A municipal shelter is ripe for setting up endowments because I – you know, I, we might always have the need to a degree. I think the model will change and all the work that Best Friends is doing in, in, uh, in preparation for 2025, it's, 
it's so important. And while the model of the municipal shelter may change, I do think that there will be an ongoing need, at least for the future, the near future. Um, after campaign expectations with my board, this is one of the last things. I think it's important to say, hey, we're getting a lot of revenue from folks who love us, but they're making major gifts. And people don't do that every year, or some people do. But a lot of people do it once in a while. So setting that expectation with your board and with, for us, with PAC, like, hey, you know, we're a brand new organization. I'm not sure how this campaign will affect us in terms of major gifts going forward. So we're gonna keep our you know, budget at X dollars and we're gonna see how fundraising goes. So those are two takeaways that I, I hadn't thought about in advance, but I lived them. So I am here to speak from experience. Um, I know that was a lot of information and I probably talked really fast. Uh, that's me. I work at Friends of PAC in Tucson, Arizona. And I'm happy to work with best friends and take some of your questions. And thank you so, so much.